For those of us who didn't get an education in American history, the civil rights era is a patchy part of our knowledge. Everyone knows Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech from the March on Washington, and most people know the Montgomery boss boycotts, probably Emmett Till, and maybe even the freedom rights too. However, today's topic is at least of equal historical significance to most of these, yet has nowhere near the same legacy. When thinking through things historically, we're looking at causes and effects, not what we find moving or even what's marketable and could be used on a Dodge Ram app. And so today we're looking at a part of the civil rights movement that saw very real change, and I'm even gonna argue that this event achieved the most for the civil rights movement during the 1960s. It doesn't feature Dr. King, Malcolm X, JFK, or Rosa Parks, but in the best sense of the word, this power grab secured the most important rights for black Americans, political rights. This is the Mississippi Freedom Summer. Hello there. Okay, so like I said, today we're covering the state of Mississippi from 1964 to 1965. And while you're here, do make sure to subscribe and to leave a comment with your thoughts below. Was the Mississippi Freedom Summer actually as important as I argue in this video? So theoretically, African Americans legally could not be discriminated against when it came to state and federal elections. The Constitution's 15th Amendment, which was instituted in 1870, that's five years after the end of the Civil War, stated that citizens cannot be prevented from voting on the grounds of race, color, previous condition of servitude, sex, or age for those above 18. But in practicality, black Americans in the South were stopped from voting in a variety of ways. To vote, you needed voter ID from the state office, but each state had different requirements to get that ID. For example, Alabama made people sit a 20-page literacy test, which if you went to an underfunded, colored, segregated school, was quite tough to pass. Secondly, employers and landlords would often fire and evict African Americans who obtained voter ID, and banks would also sometimes refuse credit to black people with voting ID. And then finally, today's state of focus, Mississippi, placed a $2 poll tax on voters, which is equivalent to $16 today. Again, if you were poor, which was the experience for most black Southerners in Mississippi, that's a dinner meal for your family. And in 1961, a man by the name of Herbert Lee went on a voting drive to try and enlist as many black Americans as possible to vote, but he was murdered in cold blood. Voting drive efforts dissipated afterwards and Mississippi's black voter participation rate was at a mega 5%. And so in 1963, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee set out to increase black voter participation. In October, its leader, Bob Moses, coordinated mock elections to prove that the low black participation rate was not by choice. 80,000 black voters elected the Mississippi NAACP branch leader, Aaron Henry, as the governor of Mississippi. Following this, in the summer of 1964, the Mississippi Summer Project began. Basically, this was a second bite at the cherry at increasing voter participation. Bob Moses had been part of the first attempt, but after Herbert Lee was murdered, Moses was very understandably fearful for his life, and he fled the country. This time, Moses attempted to enlist the help of the North, and so flyers went all around Northern universities, basically saying, look, instead of going on your Kentucky tour and taking the same photo of you holding the Eiffel Tower, instead come to Mississippi and teach black children in community centers. The education was intended to prepare them for the literacy tests, but also to teach them about their voting rights and the significance of voting in elections. This was met with quite a severe reaction by the traditionalists in Mississippi. Actually, that's an understatement. It was flat out terrorism. 35 black churches were burned down, the Congress of Racial Equality, who had earlier organized the Freedom Rides, and the SNCC headquarters were both bombed. The Mississippi KKK membership actually grew to 10,000, and James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner were murdered by the KKK, and the FBI actually bribed a Klansman $30,000 to show them the body. So if this was the response, the Mississippi Freedom Summer must have really been making waves, right? Well, not exactly. Only 1,600 more African Americans were registered to vote and only 3,000 black children were taught by the Northerners. Not enough to make any real dent. However, they put voters' rights on the national radar and the violent reactors inadvertently played themselves because their violence made what the SNCC was doing national news. And so this national attention and focus on voters' rights led to two huge impacts. Firstly, the fervor for voting rights in Mississippi led to the creation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Basically, if someone's going to be nominated to be a party's president for a presidential election, they win with delegates. Each state is given a number of delegates and these delegates, that's these guys you see on screen, head to the party's national convention and cast their vote for a candidate. There's different ways that you can become a delegate, but one common way was to appear at a party meeting at a local community hall and make a case for the candidate that you would be delegating your vote for. In Mississippi, black voters had little delegate representation and so the Mississippi delegates could easily cast their votes for a segregationist Southern Democrat. Few African Americans were willing to vote Republican because of their policy of leaving the states alone, and so the Democratic Party was seen as their main shot of making change, but it could also be the party that had a hardcore segregationist running for office. 
So the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was established in protest and 80,000 voters voted for their own delegates to attend the Democratic National Convention in Atlanta. Usually the National Convention is a formality for a sitting president, but LBJ wasn't elected and took over after the elected JFK was shot. So the Democratic National Convention was actually important in deciding who'd be the Democratic candidate for the 1964 election. And so these unofficial delegates went to the convention to cast their vote for the Democratic nominee. Now, Lyndon Johnson didn't stand for it. He was the unifier of the two rival factions, and as a Texan senator in the 1950s, he protested against integration measures. But on the other hand, as a president, he passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. So his credentials showed him as progressive enough to win a general election, but conservative enough to have the Southern Democrats still nominate him. Johnson knew that if he allowed the MFDP delegates to cast a vote at the convention, it would alienate his support based on the Southern Democrats. LBJ made a counteroffer and said that for future conventions, delegates would not count if they made it by discriminatory polling. The MFDP certainly weren't pleased with this, but if they had any chance of achieving voting legislation that stopped things like literacy tests, they needed Johnson as an ally and they needed to back someone who'd beat the Republicans who largely had a policy of not interfering with state matters. And that legislation came in 1965 through the Voting Rights Act. LBJ won re-election against Barry Goldwater and in August of the following year, the Voting Rights Bill was passed. The law prevented poll taxes, literacy tests, good character tests and constitutional interpretation tests. It also prevented voting laws from being changed without the approval of the Attorney General and declared that the federal government could take over voter registration in counties with persistent segregation. Okay, so a law was passed that fixed some loopholes. Well, it was much more than that. If a certain portion of the population isn't represented in the voting process, no one has to listen to them. I hate the term the black vote because your skin color really shouldn't define your political persuasion, but it is true that post-1965 we saw a remarkable change in campaigning strategies as politicians attempted to court the vote of black Americans. I Have a Dream was important in gaining support for the Civil Rights Bill, but if the Voting Rights Bill came first, politicians would have had no choice but to advocate a Civil Rights Bill, otherwise they would have lost the support of 11% of the voters. And that line to the Voting Rights Act can be traced to Mississippi. Don't get me wrong, this is nowhere near the only factor that led to the bill, but prior to LBJ's election, the MFDP basically got LBJ, a hardened politician, to rewrite the rules so that black Americans had a say in who became the Democratic nominee. This also totally watered down the concentration of votes for Southern Democrats and really crippled their momentum. Existing Southern Democrats like George Wallace had to totally change their tune when running for the nomination of the party afterwards. The act itself came into force the summer after the Mississippi voting drives took place. Seeing the violent response of the KKK to the SNCC's voting drives, many congressmen and women were simply persuaded that letting each state do its own thing wasn't enough and that the states were suppressing the democratic process. The bill passed the House with a 333-85 to 85 vote in July of 1965. Interestingly, the main opponents of the bill were not Republicans who advocated for states' rights. In the end, 112 out of 136 voted for the bill. But it was the Southern Democrats, of which 62 out of 282 Democrats opposed the bill, who knew that this would dilute their hold on their electorate. So if you follow the line from the Mississippi Freedom Summer to the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, to the nomination of LBJ as presidential candidate with new conditions, to ultimately Congress where the Voting Rights Act was passed, I think it's fair to say that those uni students had a much more significant summer than going on a Kentucky tour. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and let me know, am I right or am I wrong on the significance of the Mississippi Freedom Summer? On Friday, we're looking at the dismissal of Gough Whitlam and we can't wait to see you next time for our next venture into a fascinating part of history.